Namaste and in Laket. Hi, I'm Zen Benefiel and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. And as I've said before, and will continue to say, the ancient languages and their wisdom are surely applicable today. <clears throat> Namaste means the divine in me recognizes the divine in you, comes from Sanskrit, and in la catch means I am another you, and it comes from the Mayan. So think of how we could apply or you could apply those kinds of thoughts just in your head when you're meeting and greeting people along the way, and just how much difference that might make in your conversations. It really shows you care, and we care. So this episode, I have a really wonderful guest, uh, Lynn Russell, who is an expert on near-death experiences, which I really love. I, I, I'm going to have a blast with that. She's an author. She's an international keynote speaker and workshop facilitator. She's also a Unitarian chaplain, and she's written a book called The Wonder of You, What the Near-Death Experience Tells You About Yourself. So we're going to have a wonderful conversation about that. Now, she's also been a uh, single parent for 25 years, a family counselor for 28 years. She got involved with the family therapy program at the Alberta Children's Hospital and gained a lot of, of experience and skills and, and information and knowledge that she shares with her clients and her, and her kids and, and things that she works with. Um, the book actually came out of after researching 2,500 near-death experiences for Dr. Jeff Long and for his book, Evidence of the Afterlife, The Science of Near-Death Experiences. So this is going to be a really wonderful conversation, a little bit different than we've had so far, but I think you'll enjoy it. Lynn, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, cool. Me too. I, I'm really looking forward to this. So to, to get started with, I'd like to kind of uh, do a deep dive in your history for a moment, sure. or herstory in this case. <laughs> and so in your interests of the near-death experience, when did that first catch your attention and cause you to become interested? Were there you know, some inner and outer experiences that, that brought that about or, or kind of highlight that, if you would. Yeah, actually, I've been in, interested all my life. I mean, we didn't know about near-death experiences, but my mother was an atheist, <clears throat> and she believed that after you died, you just disappeared. Mm -hmm. And that terrified me. I was terrified of death and um, didn't know what to expect. You know, I was really tight quite frightened of dying. And um, so when I first, the first year near-death experience came out in 75, Dr. Moody's book, yeah. I was so excited. I thought, oh my goodness, somebody's been there, come back. And so I, I, that just turned me on. And I started off reading just about everything <clears throat> that I could read. And then when I retired from family counseling, I um, was wanting to read up, uh, to write um, a, a, a novel. Mm -hmm. And this novel had this woman, um, Astro Projecting, and, or OBE. Right. And um, so, but I had her doing things that I wasn't even sure that people who Astro Projected could do. So... So I There's all kinds of I, possibilities in that realm, right? You know, once you leave yeah, your body, who knows what's there? Yeah. So I um, decided I was going to research and talk to some people. <clears throat> well, that was a lot of years ago, and I still haven't found out the answers. <laughs> but um, but I went to OB to OBE and wound up at the NDERF, which is Near Death Experience Research Foundation. And I wound up on their site and they were looking for someone to do research. And I said, me. Yeah, what an opportunity. Yeah. You know? So how what's interesting is that, you know, it, it, and this is just reflecting on observing your, your story so far, is that you had mm -hmm. this your attention, intention, and interaction allowed that um, yes. website to show up. Right. Yeah, it, yeah, because yeah. you were looking for things. And I think most of us, many of us may 
uh, have those types of experiences, but not really recognize just what we've done as far as our own prep work in order for that opportunity to show up in front of us. Yes, yes, yes. And you don't so, have to be out of body to do that. No, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, that was so, so exciting for me that, at, and I, I was so thrilled with the information that I was learning. I was, uh, at the first, I was just interested in what happened to the people when they had a death experience. Mm -hmm. But after a little while, I was starting to get the deeper messages and sp the spiritual messages. And I had studied spiritual, all the religions of the world and uh, the different spiritual concepts. Mm -hmm. And the so Unitarian I, Church uh, includes all of those, too. That's a, one of the nice things I like about their theme, if you will. Yeah. They so, pull resources from everywhere. Yes, 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 they do. And so um, I was so thrilled with the information that I was getting back and the deeper knowledge of, mm -hmm. of what this was all about. And so that's what prompted me to write my book. Now, did you have any um, OBEs yourself that, that kind of imbued your experience with a little more uh, or a little deeper ability to ask questions about it? Not, um, well, yes, no. Um, okay. I did have, a, <laughs> I had a teeny, teeny, tiny, it, was, it wasn't even worth mentioning. Um, I left my body. I was very ill. And actually, I wondered it later. I mean, at the time, I knew I died. But then later, I said to myself, maybe that was just an illusion or, yeah. you know, a hallucination or something, because I had a very high fever. Right. Anyway, so um, I left my body. I was in the tunnel. There was uh, some guide with me, but he just looked like an ordinary guy. And we were going up and... Um, this big booming voice came down and said, take her back. It's not her time. And he said, the fellow beside me said, but she died. And he said, take her back. She has much left to do. And so, bang, I was back in my body. No, that's really but, interesting. Yeah, yeah, well, sort of. I mean, to me, after reading some of the <clears throat> very deep experiences that people have had, <clears throat> mine was pretty Mickey Mouse, actually. <laughs> Well, I don't that? think any of them are really Mickey Mouse, and don't discount yourself like that. It's, um, you know, it, it, the experiences are what we need at the moment in order to for us to take our next step in our own evolutionary process, in my opinion. And it doesn't really matter uh, how simple or complex it is. It, it simply opens the door and, and allows right. you to step through it for a while. Um, yeah. And the yeah, fact yeah. That, that's a good point. That's right. a good point. And, and so... Um, you know, because we as humans uh, tend to diminish our experiences, and we also, like you said before, we want often ward them off as hallucinations, right? And yeah. do you find yeah. that yeah. In, in your studies? Do you find that a lot of the NDEers initially believe them to be hallucinations before they really start? you know, questioning the reality and comparing their experience to others. And no, <laughs> they were absolutely sure okay. that they had, that this experience had been very real. And that was one of the elements because, okay. yeah. Um, but I want to tell you about an experience I did have. Sure. Uh, that that let, helped a great deal in my development and understanding. And I was washing the dishes one day. And I had, I was separated, single parent, had three kids, two of them were in school, and the littlest one was, um, well, she was three Still at home, right. Yeah. So anyway, um, when I had, I had three experiences, and when I had these experiences, they were always in the afternoon when the kids were gone to school, and the little one was down having a nap. Mm. So the house was quiet. And uh, the first experience, I was doing dishes at the kitchen sink, and there was a window in front of the sink, like many places, right. and there's an apple tree out in the yard. And without, I don't even know, just instantly, I became that apple tree. I wasn't even paying attention to the apple tree. And then I just had this vibration, like, 
I was the tree and the tree was me. And then I was every form of life that I could think of in the universe. And it was me. And that was, I had read about it. You know, I think that's called- that opportunity. A lot of Eastern um, traditions offer, um, a lot of the, the philosophers and, and theologians offer, you know, the, the quotes that kind of emulate that kind of, of understanding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then I, um, so that was the first experience and it was very, it probably less than a minute. Um, then the next experience was days later and I'm wiping fingerprints off the walls in the hallway. And all of a sudden I'm not seeing the wall anymore. I'm seeing an atom, a very large atom. And I'm seeing the electrons and the protons going around and I'm seeing the middle and I'm seeing the whole thing. Um, and it, it just fascinated me. And then that expanded. I, I shouldn't have said protons. Protons don't go, don't go around. It's just the electrons. Anyway. Um, That's okay. So <laughs> I, I get the image of the atom. Right. Uh, so I had seen this atom. And then that expands to our solar system. And the sun with the planets going around. And that expanded to our galaxy. And then that expanded to a sister galaxies. At least that's what I've been calling them. Mm -hmm. And um, and during this expansion thing and, and, and image imagery, I was getting a message in my mind that this didn't just happen accidentally, that there was order and planning and a great intelligence behind it all. Absolutely. And after you could explain your third, I've got something I want to share with you that I think will, okay. um, it will correlate what you've seen okay. from okay. a different perspective. And so then I, um, I heard, uh, uh, now I, I didn't hear, I got a message, but it was a knowing. It was like an absolute knowing. There was no no way I could dispute it or shove it away or anything. Right. And There's a sense from the, I don't know if it's frequency or resonance or, or what is embedded in it, but there is that knowing when you get certain pieces of information. Yeah. It's and, unquestionable. Yeah, exactly. And and I knew if this was true, just like I knew my name was mm -hmm. true. And it said that my being was somehow connected to the operation of the universe. Well, that terrified me. I didn't want to have anything to do with that. <laughs> well, I so why did it terrify you? Because I thought that it meant a great deal of responsibility that I wouldn't be able to live up to. Yeah, I just felt like- Again, it was, it was, a normal human- trait yeah. in that you know we're asked to step up it's oh my gosh am i inadequate um do i am i enough uh, can i be enough yeah, yeah. um you know exactly. all those kinds of things and sure yeah. that, that's uh, i think that's normal yeah yeah even so, in highly accomplished people yes yes well oh good i'm glad to hear that because <laughs> at this point i was just i was going back to school um sure. so i was i was a student and so yeah Anyway, um, the third experience, that was the end of the first, as the second experience. Okay. The third experience, I'm in the living room and I'm picking up toys, just, you know, and uh, just sure. making sure things are tidy. And all of a sudden, there's a presence in the room with me and I couldn't see anything. All I saw was the room, but this presence was there and there was no denying it. Um, I could feel it and, and I could feel this overwhelming amount of love that was coming to me. And it was just like, whoa. And I felt like I was connected to it in some way that, that we were connected. And that was a blow, blew me away a bit too. Sure. And then, and then I heard, had actually heard words in my ear and the words said, um, this is where you came from. And this is where you will return. And that was the end of it. But after that, I just 
I thought, if that's what happens after death, when? <laughs> You know, well, just, what's, what's interesting is that the voice came out of basically nowhere, mm -hmm. right? And so, and telling you that there's this sense of um, almost the void, right? Which edifies all the other information. And even there, there's a guy named uh, Wilbert Smith who ran Canada's UFO uh, investigations for the, in the 1950s. And he had some conversations with people from elsewhere and they're much more intelligent than we are because they've you know if they're here they've developed star travel right so that kind of sets them apart but what one of the things that they said to him is that their understanding of nothingness is almost a or is a foundation for their knowledge and wisdom and yeah. we haven't even scratched the surface of Absolutely. What that really yeah. is yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so, uh, forgive me for saying, but we've been locked into this whole negativity of original sin and um, and having Your to guilt be shame game. Yes, yes. And having to be better than we are. And really, what we are is magnificent. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that inhibits our ability for self-love. Yes. Right, yes. which is really the core of where everything begins because you can't love another you can't uh, honor respect and, and feel, really feel joy for others yeah. until you feel it for yourself you can yeah. emulate it you can fake it to you you know but you still got to make it right? yeah. Yeah. so the um was there more in, the, in that yeah there is one more experience that well actually two more um this is used later in 1980 march actually march of 1980 i was um i was graduate now and I'm I'm working uh, at my uh, at, I working I was writing a report on a family that I was working with mm. and um, and my brain was nowhere near anything to do with Chris with um, spirituality but right. anyway I heard this voice say I want to use you I got up I made sure there was nobody around <laughs> you, you want to what yeah, exactly. I rejected it instantly. No, for the exact same reason that I ex rejected the um, me being part of the universe. Mm -hmm. I uh, integral part. I, I just could not accept that much responsibility. I thought, oh, I'm for sure going to screw up. <laughs> so I didn't even accept the, the challenge. And I spent the next four years wandering around asking psychics and different people if they could help me to understand what I had to do because then I could decide whether I wanted to do it or not. Sure, sure. <laughs> and um, so then uh, four years later, I didn't hear anything in between. And as I say, four years later, I'm in her, a, um, a donut shop with my daughter and a friend. And they're, they're teenagers, 14, 15. And um, so they're just being so kids. And this voice comes back and says, I still want to use you, you know. <laughs> I have <laughs> you some time to contemplate, huh? Yeah, and actually that was verbatim. And, yeah. and I said, um, okay, fine, but I have nothing left to give. And I had been through a major illness. My house had burned down. I was dealing with three teenagers at once. Wow. And I was just wiped. And um, Empty. Yeah, yeah. Which is the perfect place. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Never thought of that, but you're right. Because when I said, I don't have anything left to give, um, the, the voice said, don't worry, I'm preparing you now. And yeah. that was it. Yeah, that, that's so cool and, yeah. and, you know, so representative of the process that, um, that folks go through in looking for um, identity and purpose, yes. right? And, and the yeah. willingness to be vulnerable enough to step into it. Yes. Um, yeah. How I related to you, uh, this is going to be kind of, I'm going to make it as short as possible. But, so I had an ND in 1975. Um, what I garnered from it, I was asked if I was willing to die for what I believed in. And uh, 
eventually chose cosmic consciousness as being that what I'm willing. And from that, I learned that we are all cosmic consciousness condensed into form. And, you know, we see it as we call it the point of light, right? But it's still connected to the great light. And we yes. bounce back and forth with, you know, over lifetimes and, you know, maybe even solar systems, who knows? Yeah. Um, so many years later, I had this question about the Trinity and because it was replicate, it was everywhere, right? So math, science, as well as religion. So I was questioning this and I was going through a process that uh, William Swigard developed in, also in the 1950s called multi-level awareness. And the facilitator was preparing me to go through, it's kind of like a hypnotherapy regression sort of spin. Mm -hmm. And my guide who had met in college shortly after my NDE showed up and simply says, come. And so I'm out of body and, and we're traveling and the facilitator is asking me questions about what, what's going on in the process is cool. such that uh, we train ourselves to, to experience and observe and relate and report back. So we're traveling for a while and, and I'm asking him, I hadn't seen him for a while. So we were kind of going over the, um, the last few years. And, and the first question I asked was, where are we going? He said, just wait, you'll see. So eventually we come upon this solar system with three huge spheres of light with had kind of a golden tinge and a rainbow sparkly almost appearance to it with about a dozen uh, bright green planets all about the same size in, in a uh, planar orbit around them around them and we're looking at it from the uh, from a distance and I felt like Ellie in contact right where I just nearly came to tears because of the awe mm -hmm. I was experiencing mm -hmm. and then a voice many as one could have been just the three suns could have been the entire solar system says we are not only your forefathers, we are also the forefathers of your solar system. Yes. yes. And so I started asking questions, you know, wanting to ask questions. My guide Zephyr says, nope, that's it. That's all you get. You'll <laughs> figure it out. Right. So from that point, then it took me back into the micro, which is the proton, electron, and neutron. And the, the micro example of those three spheres that then the consciousness is encased or not encased it because consciousness really can't be encased it's in the space in between them mm -hmm. and so there's this innate structure and order and it's natural and, and we just don't understand that but having that and having that little inkling of okay this is relational and there it's a fractal that appears ubiquitously throughout creation so now we've got a little more foundation to work with and understand now quantum physics is proving those kinds of things actually do exist in the multiple dimensions and nepi and close and, and their work with the triadic dimensional distinction vortical paradigm which <laughs> makes, right that's a big one right and it, it basically they posit and this came out in 2010 and uh, and i found them through uh, jeff mishla when i was researching some of his shows in order to prepare for my interview with him and uh, so they posit that consciousness, space, and time are tethered across nine dimensions for the physical experience as we're in body, but that doesn't eliminate other dimensional experiences beyond that. So it all fit with the kind of ex direct experience that, that I had had. And I find that, you know, unless you have direct experiences of these types of things, it's easy to ward it off as hallucinations or dismiss it or deny it or, or you know, want to think somebody's a little wacko, um, yeah. right? And, until you have one of those experiences and it's like, oh my God, they were right, right? Yeah. This is yeah. a, a whole different place. And yet we're still in these bodies. So that would indicate that maybe we're a little more connected to other things than we once realized, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So yeah. in your research of the, the 2,500 NDEs, what were some of the congruent themes? Oh, there were a list and I don't have it before me, but okay. there's well, a off list the top of, of your head, what was the most consistent theme that you found uh, or at least observed? Okay, oneness, oneness. That's the most consistent one. Okay. That's that, that, that connection to all. Okay. That 
no matter what they saw, they became it and it became them. And the, the, that, that, that was the big theme that flew, flowed through all of the experiences. Kind of like my introduction with in La Ketch, you know, I am another you. So yes, exactly. And, and you once you identified that. with the tree, right? Yes, you yes the tree exactly. And it was you. So these are all experienceable things, yes. but they're, yes. and they're in fleeting moments of, of um, what I, I think the best terms are non-linear and non-local. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so that that whole concept was very, very deep in almost everything, because not only are we one with everything, but we are the source. Mm -hmm. And we can't be one with everything and not also be one with the source, because how could that be? The exactly. Source is the and, and that's apocalyptic. Right. That, that's I, you know, uh, having read all the books, one of the things that in the book of Revelations, it talks about God dwelling in man and that this period of time, it, it, you know, we think anyway, is the apocalypse. Well, the apocalypse doesn't mean catastrophic occurrences. Right. It means unveiling. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So why would that, you know, there's a natural order, in my opinion, right. that is embedded in, in this oneness. Right. Mm -hmm. We understand the concept of oneness and yet many in the from a left brain perspective right see an inadequacy of detail of structure yeah. Yeah. Um, and they don't understand how it all works so they try to right. fit it all together or dismiss it entirely because it just sounds or make up stories <laughs> right well, from the creative side from the right brain then there's this understanding and knowing side of, of this experience of, of the sensation of oneness, right? That the left brain is kind of uh, bereft of. And then the corpus callosum gets involved, right? Yes, <laughs> and there's okay. this transference, because yeah. that's a translator, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so there's this transference of information where the, the two brains or two sure. hemispheres begin sure. to get to know each other and, and find that sense of oneness between them, yeah. right? And that doesn't eliminate that oneness doesn't eliminate the the for lack of a better division of labor that we experience on this planet right there all those things still need to be in place and it's all part of that complexity within the simplicity yes, of that yes, oneness yes yeah yes, you know, we don't yes. have to give up our you know individuality in any matter of fact when we tune in, and, and I use the term to find our perfected form, fit, and function in the world, uh, and by design, we have one if we consider that theory as, you know, if we just give ourselves to that and explore from yeah. that perspective. Yeah. So then as we find this, there's a certain sense of, of uh, harmony, if you will, in our lives and flow, uh, like, um, Mihaly Csikszentmi, Mihaly writes in uh, Flow, the Psychology of Optimal Experience, where mm -hmm. life becomes like a jazz quartet, and you're just in this timelessness, and, and you're conversing together. And, oh, cool. I right? like the imagery. <laughs> Isn't it? Um, and so, you know, all of these things, like you and I are talking about right now, hopefully these are rippling through the thoughtmosphere, and those interconnected opportunities for others to kind of listen and say oh yeah well that makes sense or oh yeah i get i had that mm -hmm. right and mm -hmm. so we're mm -hmm. working on and especially now um, and let me ask you this question do you feel like in this time period now that we're we have a, a new opportunity to learn how to work together better oh yeah oh i see it oh i see it so much i'm quite old so i i remember ah you're what, still young Inside I am. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You like to play. Sure, I do. Um, but I remember what the world was like in the 50s after the war. I remember the war, but after the war, the World War II. Right. Um, um, after that, like I can remember what people were like and how they were with animals. And I mean, if they saw a dog drowning, they would let it drown. They would have just, 
dead watched. They would, they did horrible things to animals. They were so cruel. And each other. Yes, and well, of course, and also um, nature. That was that. That was something that they didn't even consider. Like they didn't even think about it. And ecology. I mean, what was that? <laughs> you know. So we well, really they didn't really have to yet. No, no. Well, no. We there should was, have. There were some who were looking at that, but yeah. by and large, you know, it, it's like nature always self-corrected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we really have been very spoiled in uh in our world and and we are growing beautifully and i i i credit from the 70s 60s 70s that's when the whole awakening of the um spiritual perspective and getting away from the religion right. um, and there was even a psychologist that came up with the term cultural creative during that time there were, there were two of them actually that wrote a book Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of determined that these, for lack of a better, awakened souls right. were actually doing things in the business and corporate world to edify that kind of mentality. Um, mm -hmm. Now, granted, the overarching activity at that time really was uh, oblivious to what we were doing to nature because we didn't really understand mm -hmm. what the effects of, for instance, the atom bomb, as well as fossil fuels and, and those kinds of things, yeah. we, we didn't realize just, uh, and of course, even with the atom bomb, uh, not Wilbur Smith, but there were others during that 1950s time frame mm -hmm. that had some communications from other worlds in that you guys really need to stop messing with the atom because you don't understand how uh, right. You know, it's like the the subatomic or quantum levels of it and what the destruction of it does mm -hmm. to the multiple dimensions. Yeah. And so it, it's, I don't know that it's infectious, but it, and one would think that there would be some reparation available uh, over time, but still there's that initial, we destroyed something, now it has to be healed somehow. Yeah, and, and, and. I have a thought, actually I borrowed it from uh, Joel Goldsmith. I don't know if you know Joel Goldsmith's work. Not familiar, but, but that's okay. There, there's lots of people I don't know. Yeah, and he <laughs> yeah. talked about, um, well, I think he was a, one of the forerunners in the oneness kind of thinking. And um, anyway, he talks about that we are the earth we are the universe and if we just destroyed the world we would just build another one but we would take our lessons with us to mm -hmm. the next one yeah because we we are we we are the ones you know people understand when i say you create that's uh, the, your death experience and people say, yeah, that makes sense to them because it depends on what you've experienced in your life. Right. And you yeah. carry whatever preconceived notions or experiences that you've had into that moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah. It, and it depends, you know, sometimes I, I've assisted those you know, in, in process and uh, been able to use some techniques to connect them with others on the, the other side that they've known already. And so it makes our transition that much mm -hmm. more um fear free mm. yeah good right because there, there's really no reason for that it's just a transition of of energy yeah and yeah. and it's okay right yeah. um and it's quite freeing and and it just um the consciousness is still there and it's able to communicate effectively when we're able to be in that open vulnerable place to allow it to do so yeah. and the preconceived notions of oh, you can't do that oh that's evil or whatever yeah, yeah right yeah, we're, yeah. we're oh, we set our own limitations yeah um, and so you were mentioning about business and mm -hmm. right now business is pretty negative 
from the point of view that they don't care about the ecology primarily. They only care about the money. Well, right. And it's, I call it the uh, profit, over, or profit over people and planet agenda. And I think where you're going to go is toward the people and planet over profit side of it. Uh, yes, but where I want to go beyond that to, okay. first of all, we have to get rid of the old men. <laughs> so we're in big business, I mean, you know, that is like the Trump. Well, kind yeah, of the traditionalists and the old mentality mm -hmm. that doesn't include, yeah. and yeah. it's really, I, I find yeah. it to be a, a holistic picture of the mind, body, spirit, and planet. And that's the, there's a regenerative community building or, or regenerative culture movement that, that's happening now that's that I yeah. think is the forefront of this next wave. Yeah. Absolutely. And so we need to get rid of those locked in time kind of thinking so that we can have business open up. Mm -hmm. and, and it's happening. It's happening. Younger people are getting in there. So it's starting. <clears throat> but the other thing is we need to understand that just like we create our death experience, we are creating this experience. And we are creating this world. Absolutely, it, it's more, well, the death experience is a singular creation where our reality here is a co-creation mm -hmm. where we find agreement and resonance with others and move in those ways mm -hmm. rather than the, uh, the, comp the competitive position so we're yeah. switching from competitive to collaborative <clears throat> the only difference between here and there is time space mm -hmm. that time and space are what's holding us that our concepts here but really there is no here <laughs> right it, it's our well it, okay so i'm going to re reference smith's book again one of the other things that they mentioned was that uh, reality begins with a point, the individual begins with a point that has a specific spin. And that spin could be seen as a frequency, right? right. right. And then that reality manifests be from our awareness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so we are uh, able to... Uh, let's say anticipate events and that absolutely so that's the that's where the attention yeah. goes and the intention is to have them uh, be successful beneficial uh, appropriate loving and, and caring for each other and nature right so how how does this in your mind uh, in in your observation how do you see that trending Oh, I think the world is changing to the better. Um, it's not doing it fast enough for me because I want to be here when it happens, but I don't know that that's going to be. You just <clears throat> never know now, do we? It, it's that's quite true. possible. Yeah, that's true. Um, so, um, but the world is, is becoming a much kinder, a much more open, a much more accepting place than it ever was and it's starting from the millennials down mm -hmm. so um yeah and and so that's marvelous i love it that's around the 80s 90s and so the world is changing big time Absolutely. we just have to give it a little more time it takes approximately 50 years for a new way of seeing a new way of being. gosh that kind of matches up with what jose arguez had written about the segue between ages between the Piscean and, and the uh, Aquarian age is a 50-year window segue if you will uh, uh, where yeah. awareness and consciousness escalates and in a talk I had with him many years ago um, where the that awareness and consciousness curve almost parallels the information curve and then mm -hmm. it gets to a point where the, the tipping point right which right according to them, was the winter solstice of 2012. So once you reach that tipping point, then what? Well, you have this awareness and consciousness, and it naturally is in you, so you live that, and so you begin applying that back into whatever system you're in, 
whether it be a family unit or a global corporation, right? And that this transition then begins to cause what doesn't resonate with that to bubble up to the surface. Yes. Um, in some ways, it, it, it's you can be kind and gentle with it. In others, it's extremely disruptive because it's been in place for so long that now everybody has to become aware of it. Yeah. Yeah. And oh gosh, what's happening in the world right now? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it gives us this opportunity. And, and one of the other things in, in my NDE was I was told before I came back was that uh, there will be a new world order in my lifetime mm -hmm. and it will be one of harmony among people and planet. So, yeah. And no. that's, a, that's a good point because what I find people saying is it's coming, but they're wrong. It's here now. I, it, it's already happening. We're in the process of it. And yes. like anything, it, you know, um, it takes time and, and maybe we can me measure time by the change in entropy. And the less entropy we have, the faster time will evolve and the quicker we can get things done. To take us to the that that next yeah yeah, yeah. Exa exactly exactly as i say we just need to get rid of the old thinking right so back to the ndes then and, mm -hmm. and your studies how do those kinds of, of thoughts and, and um, summations uh, where do they show up in in those in that research how do they show up I'm not sure what the question. I'm sorry. I'm not okay, quite. Not a problem. I, that, let me reframe that. So okay. in your in your studies about the the NDEs and the and the different people, you, we mentioned the mm -hmm. the themes that you saw that were congruent. Mm -hmm. So how would it? First of all, is this theme congruent, and mm -hmm. how is it showing up as far as maybe the priority and how people are uh, have this awareness now? Okay. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what, so as I say, this feeling of connectedness to everything was prevalent throughout <clears throat> the whole death experience. Mm -hmm. I, excuse me, I'll close. <coughs> sorry. Mm -hmm. um, Don't be sorry, be Lynn. And but thank <laughs> yeah. you. Yeah. Um, I'm also Canadian, and we apologize. Oh, I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can have fun. There's, there's no <laughs> reason not to have fun with life. If you're not yeah. having fun, then you might consider doing something else. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so um, the fact of that oneness permeates everything, because that's the bottom line of existence mm -hmm. of, of this life end of that and <clears throat> so the experiences that people have on the other side is because they are creating it and it doesn't mean that that's what heaven is like it's their heaven right but it's not heaven now do you think this may be precursive awareness is something that's already embedded in that consciousness that uh, like a file system, you know, that that file opens at that particular moment for them to experience. No, I think it's already there. But that's what I'm saying. But yeah, and then we let go of time and space, and then, but we continue to create because we're creators. Right. Yeah. And so people will, some of them, not all of them, but some sure. souls, when they're on the other side, see themselves as physical because they brought a physical concept of a body with them, mm -hmm. ethereal. <clears throat> but then they wake up and say, wait a minute, this isn't me. And they see themselves as a speck of light. And then they realize that they're not human, that they are soul that they are conscious point of they light are, which is yes exactly the right. soul, the spirit and they also see these lights going in and out of this enormous light <clears throat> that everybody talks about the light mm -hmm. and they see these things and they be and they come to realize they are a part of the light and the people who enter not everybody that enters into the light 
but many people who enter inside the light during their death experiences actually become creators and see themselves creating the universe and experiencing. So um, I recommend anybody to read um, Mellon Thomas Benedict's NDE because it's probably the most astounding of all the NDEs there are. Just mind-boggling, beautiful, okay. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I've um, I, I wrote up mine because it uh, it was quite different. Most of them, uh, and I have yet to find those that have had uh, non-trauma related, right? Mm. Uh, mine was simply, I prayed to know what truth was. I was willing to give up, give my life mm -hmm. to know it. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. asked and I went. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I left my body, looked at it laying across my dorm room bed. I was living in uh, the honor storm at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana at the time. And I turned back to look where I was going and immediately engulfed my white light. And I knew immediately because I was analyzing what was happening that I was thinking. And so I knew at that point that, oh, there really is no death. Ah, and, yeah. but it got boring because ah. all it was was white light. And as a teenager, I was 18 years old, right? And so <laughs> it was like, give me more. And so I questioned, is there more? And that's when I moved into this indigo background with points of light around me and was told that these are those that I'm to work with in order to help facilitate that new world mm -hmm. order. Mm -hmm. um, but it was specific in that everything will be there at its appointed time. So uh, apparently there is a timetable of some yeah. sort and that we're all participating in it, whether we realize it or not, yeah. because that point of light, whether we admit that it is within us or not, every one of us have it. And, you know, hopefully we'll get to that place where, uh, and now I believe it, it's even more possible with how quantum physics is reflecting all of this from a science standpoint yeah. of what the, you know, ancient spiritual masters and, and, right. and the years and everybody's been, you know, loosely kind of trying to frame it because this is, it's a, uh, it's a completely new area, yeah. right? Yeah. That yeah. we are, um, yeah, although ending to at the speed of surrender. <laughs> yes, yes, I like that. I like that. <clears throat> um, scientists hate their, us using their work in a, a spiritual man way, and yet it Some is Some have, there. but the others, you know, that yeah. that too is shifting because they're realizing they can't argue with it. <laughs> you know, you can't argue with the truth. You can try. Yeah, which is I've a good had, thing because that even proves it further because the truth loves to be challenged. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, I love it. It's such a, it's so exciting. It, it um, really is. And I found that with my, because I was interested, I became interested in science in my mid 30s somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I'm in, I'm in my early 80s now. <clears throat> so um, that's a lot of years and 40 odd and, and bless I'd your heart as an octogenarian <laughs> and i and call I, that being geriatrically gifted they call us super agers but really? you know what I, I i don't know if i agree with this concept of super agers because <clears throat> there are i have a gang of friends that are all <clears throat> 65 and up uh -huh. and and they are all bright. All of them can, can you know, with their memories are good. They can sure. have a good discussion about things. So I, I think 80s is changing and 80s is the old 60s. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I feel like 60s are, are the, the new 60s, the old 40. Um, <laughs> right. Right. You know, this brings up a... Go ahead. You had something you wanted to say about that? I've lost it. I've lost okay. it. Okay. So let me plug this question is in place of that. How, being elders, right, we see these um, capabilities and, and needs for 
distributing at least some additional knowledge back to the millennials, right? <laughs> As they're coming up because they don't have the life experience. They, they don't have the work, the relationship, the, you know, it's like we, we every decade we have this learning curve, right? And, and kind of goes along with that, uh, which is kind of funny. My uh, parents sent me to a, a clinical psychologist after my NDE. And after the third <laughs> session, he says, you know, you're not crazy. You have a spiritual awakening, which just really made, you know, it made, made me feel so much better about things at that time because he yeah. recognized and, and offered some wisdom as to what I was going through. But he said, you know, most people don't go through it till the mid forties if they ever do. <laughs> and that kind of made me curious. And then in my mid forties, I realized, oh, empty nesters. Well, that makes sense, mm -hmm. right? So th that's one of those, you know, cyclical patterns, if you will. And, and yeah. another friend yeah. of mine was that mixed blood Cherokee was saying that you know, we, in our tradition, we cannot join or form a council until we're 51. Oh. So at that time, you're usually a grandparent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's this uh, unspoken structure, right, that we don't necessarily talk about and recognize as to how we evolve together and then being able to relate that process to the younger ones in such a way that they don't just give us a stiff arm, right? It's mm -hmm. like trying to tell the teenager, give a teenager answers they aren't asking questions for, right? right? We're just right. trying to say, hey, you need to do this because, mm -hmm. right? Well, they're not asking about that yet. So yeah. it's just yeah. gonna go yeah. in one ear and out the other. So how do we open those ears? Oh, <clears throat> I think we, first of all, I do remember what I wanted to say before, okay, but good. anyway, um, with teenagers, we need to allow them to experience and, and test things because <clears throat> up until that time that they become a teenager, they have had mommy and daddy tell them mm -hmm. what to do. And now they want to test it out for themselves. And they become very resentful because they feel like they're one foot in, in grown up right. and one foot in child. <clears throat> and so they can get very resentful if adults try and step in there, you know. The, and that's the pretty authority. consistent with, the, you know, all teenagers. Yeah, yeah. And, and, right? and so what, or me. Yeah. And so what we need to have is a safety net place where they can come and be and be safe and 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 be fed up and clothed and looked after but allowed to go out there and experience but there are some pretty serious dangers out there the drugs and, mm -hmm. and rough and and all boys want to drive fast you know <laughs> and that kind of thing right. so so we need to educate them before they get to teach ahead of time so that they know what to expect. So what I hear you saying is that we really need to look at our parenting skills mm -hmm. and step back from what we thought have been uh, traditional or maybe even haphazard mm -hmm. um, attempts at, at management and control that's of their right. lives yeah. and to be able to step back and, and start asking different questions. And you know, I had a, one of my guests recently mentioned he had a 17 year old son and uh, I'm hoping to raise another one myself. Um, and they love video games and they can become quite addicted to them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the multiplayer aspects, they shift roles almost uh, spontaneously in you know the employee the manager and the leader uh -huh. aspects and, and until he sat with him and, and actually watched he wasn't aware that mm -hmm. hey these are really good skills that the kids are picking up mm -hmm. um, and we see the destructive side of things with the war games and things that where yeah. it kind of um, dehumanizes that act mm -hmm. Uh -huh. And that there are <clears throat> there are some 
negative and positives. And sure. Both. Sure. Right. Yeah. And and this is where the parental uh, observation and oversight. Yeah. Too needs, too many needs. parents think that when their kids get to teens, they're all grown up, and I don't need to. I can lax up with my right. parenting, and that's wrong. No, that's when you need to actually have more, yeah. uh, not necessarily oversight, conversations, right? Yeah. To get them to think where you're asking questions yeah. and getting them. Yeah. Um, and in your parenting, as, as the child grows, if you get them to take responsibility for their own actions, and that's all, you don't need to spank. You just have to say to them, you spilt that, you wipe it up. You broke that, you either go without or... You know, if it's intentional, if sure. it's in, or rough, rough treatment, then right. gee, that's too bad. I guess you don't have it. You know, and those are consequences of of their own actions. And it's real by life. The time, yeah, and by the time they get to be teenagers, they understand that because <clears throat> you could start that at two and three. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So in. But, uh, um, mm -hmm. Speaking of kids, right, you, uh, you've been working on, a, or actually uh, just published a um, yeah. book, yes. um, Warple. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Warple is a spiritual book for tweens, um, children who are just heading into the teenage years. Mm -hmm. So 9 to 12, 13, around there. <clears throat> and um, the story... What I've done is I've talked about oneness and how we are all connected. Right. But I've done it through adventure and, and fun and silliness. So it's the story of a fellow named Cam. Uh, and Cam has an attitude. And he's heading for serious trouble. He doesn't think so, but, you know, it's... There. Right. It, all the signs are there for anybody <clears throat> to see. Yeah. Except yeah. him. Yeah. And he's 13. And so, and he thinks the world's against him. And so um, he winds up going into this world, this other dimension uh, called Warpal. And he meets all kinds of warm, fuzzy creatures. And with these creatures, they teach him lessons. And um, one of them <clears throat> is that we're all one. Another one is they, he learns that kindness and um, caring are contagious. And so, you know, pass it on kind of thing. And Just like other, happiness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other thing is that they also learn um, that anger reverberates back on you. So, you know, you have to pay attention to that. And the third, fourth thing that he, they learn, that the book teaches is um, love is more than just an emotion. Love is the greatest power in the universe. So that's what the book is, at, you well, know, like, so it's a spiritual book, right. but because I can't do anything other than that. <laughs> well, you've brought your um your research your study your wisdom uh, and and spun it into a tale and really storytelling it is the optimal way to share knowledge yeah, and wisdom yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and engaging kids especially to get them to consider you know as i know when i read books i, I become them especially mm -hmm. if they're adventure novels mm -hmm. or, or something like that sure, we all sure. do that's how we have uh, non-linear, non-local experiences, right? And a sign of a good author. author. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Ab absolutely. And, and that is truly a gift. Um, now, in the um, the shift of being able to um, see things in this oneness, and I'm going to go back to the NDE research, uh, oftentimes, and, and I I'm going to go into more the, I don't know if it's Hasidic or just Jewish, um, the 72 names of God and the 36 greater, 36 lesser. And, and oftentimes those get confused. And, and the Gnostics talk about the archons of being 
these non-physical beings, but they're bene beneficent or benign, they're never malevolent, but they, it's like we get the memo, right, about the oneness or, or all the different, and, and of course, there's a, a huge list of items that we have to, you know, work through. And then the other side actually tests us to see if we got the memo. It, it's yeah. not evil. It's not, um, right, demonic yeah, like or anything that. like that. Because this is the back end of the oneness. You, you've got one side constantly offering, yeah, okay, here's the way. And the other right. going, okay, we're going to test you to make sure that you understand the way. Because these are the things that you have to work through in order to be in that way. Right, and not be in the way of yourself. <laughs> so, I I see that as as playing. I'm sorry. I, it's not playing to other people, but I I think it's it's our way of trying to find understanding, and so we play with things, and we we try this one, and we try this one, we try. But in reality, there is only one spirit. Right. And all of those that you talked about and all of the universe and all of the different life forms are part of it. Because, and this is what I remember what I was going to say. My studies, both from the science and the near-death experiences, have taught me that everything is consciousness. There is nothing else but consciousness. And it expresses in bazillion types of ways mm -hmm. for its own learning and growth. And so we are learning and growing because each one of us is an individual yeah. and experiences things in individual ways. Absolutely. It's like Nietzsche and, said, you know, God's just looking for playmates. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yes, and yes, I think so because in my book, what I what I say, uh, the near death experience book, um, what I say is that can you imagine, just imagine, being this amazing, intelligent, creative force in nothingness, with nothing around you, no sounds, no sights, nothing, just blackness. You would be creating in a minis, millisecond, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, nanosecond. <clears throat> Creation has to be. What? The Look source it, creates because it has to. It sure. does not have a choice. And it's almost, um, and here's another playful view, close your eyes, open them up, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. There's this, I had an experience one time, I, I was walking, um, in Sedona in between Bell Rock and Cathedral Rock. And, mm -hmm. and there was a, a path where six, well, three paths crossed and it set up almost a perfect hexagram. And I stood in the middle of it. And as I closed my eyes, I heard what sounded like a, a flutter, right? That started from a very high pitched sound and, and mm -hmm. descended to a very low sound when I closed my eyes. And it was like, I got this impression of layers uh -huh. And when I opened my eyes back up, I heard it in reverse. That's the only time I've ever heard it. It was just wow. weird. And I hadn't really thought about it in, until just now. It edifies what we've been talking about, right? Because in that expansion of consciousness, we're yeah. connected mm -hmm. to all kinds of dimensions. We just don't necessarily mm -hmm. understand that yet. Mm -hmm. And it's coming, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So, uh, this has been a wonderful conversation. Now, let me ask you before we, we have to close it out. What would you offer um, a, a person who either has or ha has not had an NDE, but just a, a something that they might be able to use as an anchor for their daily experience to mm -hmm. contemplate as they're moving through it? Yeah. One of the things that when I was doing family counseling, one of the things that I was shocked at was how negative parents thought of themselves. They, some, some parents absolutely hated themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, how can you be good to anyone? Mm 
if you hate yourself so much. And um, so I want people to think about this. I want them to think, am I an honest person? Am I hardworking? Do I give, give, would I help others if they needed it? Would I, would, am I a caring, giving kind of person? Do I love my children or my, or my relatives or the people that are close to me? Do I, you know, ask yourself those kind of questions. And if the answer is yes, then you're lying to yourself. <clears throat> You've lied to yourself most of your life by telling yourself that these negative things. You're less than. You're really beautiful. You're magnificent. And that is your reality. That is your reality. You are absolutely magnificent. So that's what I believe. Awesome. Lynn, this has been so enjoyable. The time's just flown by. So we must have been very harmonic. Um, <laughs> <right. laughs> Had a great change in entropy. Um, I really appreciate you and your work and I will have the information, um, your website, your books and things below right. in the description because um, I think they're, they're valuable and, and people need to have access. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And just send my love out to all of your audience. You just did. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much again. And namaste and in la catch. Thank you for watching this episode of One World in a New World. I'm Zen Benefiel, and I will see you next time.